Today we're going to start a new uh, segment in the course. So, um, so far in this course, let me recap a little bit what we've studied. We've talked about you know, the computational resources that you might care about when you're designing algorithms and how to understand how much of these resources are needed. And the main one that in, you know, in complexity theory and also algorithms that you worry about is time, running time. So we talked a lot about that. And uh, another important one that we spent five lectures or so on is space, memory usage. And starting today and going for a couple lectures, we're going to talk about randomness. And I think there's kind of um, two different issues you might come to think about when thinking about randomness in the context of computational complexity and as a resource. So one issue is actually just how um, other resources like time and space get affected once you permit randomness. So you know, the main question here, and probably the main question to do with randomness, is can you, you know, save on time and space if you allow randomness in your computation? And you know, the other issue that you can think about is just um, exactly treating it like a resource like we did for time and space. And from, to that end, you might ask yourself, um, you know, can, you know, given a randomized algorithm, you know, much like uh, we might say, can you decrease its time usage if we want to speed it up? Or can you decrease its space usage? You might ask, you know, can we reduce it's randomness usage. So if you feel that um, random bits are like a precious resource that you might want to conserve, which might be sort of true in the sense that it's hard in, in, in real life to somehow get a hold of truly random bits, then you might want to try to minimize them. And uh, in fact, you might even try to minimize them. This is general task, by the way, is called derandomization. Uh, and you might even see if you can minimize them all the way down to zero. In other words, take your algorithm that's randomized and somehow make a non-random version of it that has, let's say, approximately the same qualities, about as fast, about as much space usage, same, solves the same problem. And you might want to do that if you're really, you know, let's say worried about error in a randomized algorithm or something like that, or just for interest sake. Okay, so you know, before we dive into details, I want to spend a little time at a, a higher level discussing the issue of randomness. So you know, the first question is why randomness? Why do we even bother to study randomized computation or who thought of it? Or, I mean, why, why should we do it? Well, actually, I mean, I think you've probably seen this discussed before in other courses, like 251 and uh, 451 if you've taken that. I mean, um, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, for some uh, you know, computing applications or for some scenarios, algorithmic scenarios, it's not just that like, randomness might help you. I mean, somehow it's like, fundamentally necessary for the, for de by definition. You, know, you need randomness almost by definition. Okay, so I'm thinking about here things like you know, simulation, like if you want to write an algorithm that you know, does a random simula simulation of some process, then of course you, just, you need randomness. Or cryptography is another example where it doesn't even really make sense to talk about cryptography unless you have you know, the, the players of the computational processes have the ability to generate random strings. Because how can you have a secret string if it's not you know, the, the first line of the algorithm cannot be, let the secret string be blah. That's not going to work out for cryptography. So it has to be chosen randomly. Um, this is actually not what we'll talk about in uh, these kinds of things in this class. Um, instead, we'll talk about this other phenomenon, which I think you've also probably seen, you know, before discussed in, in 251 and other classes, 
which is this interesting phenomenon that even for, you know, just plain old decision problems, you know, like there's a language, you want to write an algorithm that decides if the string is in that language, even for plain decision problems, which have seemingly nothing to do with randomness, Well, it, um, sometimes the fastest algorithm we know is randomized. So this is a, you know, a phenomenon that people sort of came to discover in maybe the early 70s. Prior to that, they didn't think too much about you know, using randomized computation to solve like a, like a non-random problem. And they started to find that, you know, for some problems they could solve them pretty quickly if they allowed themselves a random algorithm. And they didn't know how to solve it as quickly, or maybe they didn't know how to solve it at all, let's say in you know, polynomial time, if they had to use a deterministic algorithm. So that's um, an interesting phenomenon that we'll talk about more in a, a few minutes. That's why randomness, uh, or why you, you know, might be interested in using randomness in your computations. But let's, let's ask the opposite question. Maybe this is not phrased precisely right, but why, you know, not randomness? Like, why might you perhaps not want to use randomness in a computation? Well, there's a couple of, um, you know, obvious answers you might ask. One is the notion of error. Of course, you know, fundamental to the, you know, the notion of randomized computation is that there's going to be some probability that your algorithm makes an error. It gives the wrong output. I mean, if you insist that there's no error and that with 100% probability it gives the right output, then you know, it may as well just be a deterministic algorithm. So you know, once you admit randomness, you're admitting you know, that you're going to relax your standards a little bit about you know, the quality of an algorithm in terms of whether it always gives the correct solution. But uh, one thing I could say is, in, in, in practically speaking, and in many ways, it's not really a l real problem. And uh, you also may have seen this before, and we'll talk about it uh, more in this lecture. But you know, generally, if you have a randomized algorithm that gives the correct answer with pretty decent probability, by like repeating it a few times, you can amplify this success probability and make it succeed with extraordinarily high probability, like practically one. So for example, Yes, you know, it's not hard to show, or we'll see that you can generally, let's say, if you're doing a computation on an n-bit string, you can reduce error to less than you know, 2 to the minus n probability at the expense of factor order n in the running time. Actually, I picked this 2 to the minus n rather arbitrarily. Basically, it could be 2 to the minus k, and you could put a k here. So you could take k to be 100, and that'll increase the running time by a constant factor, which, OK, maybe in practice, 100 times slower is not so great. But in this class, we don't really care about constant factors. And then if you have an algorithm that errs with probability like 2 to the minus 100, you know, it's, in practice, it's never going to happen. I mean, it's more likely that an asteroid will strike the Earth during the computation than, you know, it, an event with probability 2 to the minus 100 will happen. So in some sense, you know, error is not really so bad. So that's uh, not so bad. Another question which you know, ties back to this one is, you know, you might ask yourself, where do I get these random bits from? So, you know, when we design a randomized algorithm in theory, we assume that like it has access to like, you know, perfectly uniformly random bits that are independent from each other. But, you know, in practice, we have to ask ourselves where these would come from. And it's a bit of an interesting philosophical or maybe physical question, you know, are there any sources of true randomness? You can get into like quantum theory and philosophy and so forth and so on. Um, you know, of course, in practice, what happens, you know, we use some kind of uh, pseudo-random number generator. So this is a 
weird acronym that comes up in complexity theory, pseudo-random generator. The P really throws you off, but that's the acronym. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, an actual deterministic process, maybe seeded by some physical process that you think is sort of random, like the clock or whatever. Um, and it seems in practice that it usually works fine, even though these bits are not perfectly random. So actually, complexity theory has a lot to say about this, and we might even get into it a little bit in the next lecture. But again, similarly to here, like in practice, you know, this issue doesn't seem to be such a big deal. Um, so in fact, you can sort of reread this title instead of why you should have not randomness, you know, like, why not randomness? In the sense that it's actually a scene fine. I mean, the error is not really a big deal, and the random bits, you know, in practice doesn't seem like a big deal. And um, indeed, people are actually perfectly happy with it, but, you know, both in algorithms theory and in complexity theory. And you know, we kind of, in this course, talked about efficient computation and feasible computation, and we had kind of this vague principle that, like, polynomial time was sort of a good theoretical proxy for, you know, efficient or reasonably, reasonable algorithms. And in fact, you know, you know, the prevailing you know, convention also is that, in fact, randomized polynomial time is a perfectly acceptable notion of what you can do efficiently. So in other words, you know, both in algorithms and complexity, people feel that randomized algorithms are A-OK. -okay, and that, you know, uh, randomized poly time It's like a good, you know, notion of like feasible algorithm, you know, in real life. So uh, this issue of, you know, de-randomization is very, very interesting, you know, theoretically. But, you know, you should think about it more as interesting, you know, theoretically or philosophically. Like, do we really need randomness as opposed to like, you know, we're really desperate to do it because like we don't like randomness for some reason. Um, good. So actually, let me get back to this, you know, uh, starred point that, I mean, another reason to really like randomness is because of it in the sense that, you know, there are some problems, you know, not like tons of problems. You know, there's, there's thousands of algorithmic problems out there that don't have this property, but there are some interesting ones where, you know, we really, um, the fastest or the best way we know to solve it uses randomness. And we currently don't really know how to get an equally good algorithm that's deterministic. So I want to talk about some fast randomized algorithms. OK, and I have it up on the board already. Ta -da. So, um, it's not an algorithms class, but I want to tell you just a tiny bit about each of these problems because they're all examples of ones where we know how to do them you know, better or maybe at least easier using randomness. And some of these uh, you've seen before, maybe I mentioned before, maybe some of these you have not seen before. Okay, so you don't have to memorize everything I'm going to say here, but I just wanted to tell you some examples. So primality testing is a very famous example. It's an extremely important computational problem. I just give you an, a number with a huge number of digits, and you want to know if it's prime or not. And it's so like one of the first examples where randomness seemed to help a lot. So in fact, it was like the mid-70s when it was discovered that there are efficient algorithms for testing if a number is prime uh, if you're allowed randomness. So efficient randomized algorithms that will test if a number is prime or not. And those are the ones that are still used in practice today, like the Miller-Rabin algorithm. It was invented in the 70s. Um, and it, uh, for example, runs in about quadratic time, n squared if n is the number of digits. And for the super long time, like the, we didn't know any deterministic algorithm that tested primality in polynomial time. And you know, then there was a big breakthrough in 2002 by Agarwal, Kyle, and Saxena. And they showed that there is a deterministic algorithm to test if a number is uh, prime in polynomial time. Um, but it's definitely more complicated, and like the super fastest tweaked version of it runs in time like order n to the sixth, which is really bad in practice. I mean, if you don't want to do that on a thousand digit number, whereas uh, an order n squared time algorithm is perfectly fine. So in practice, people are like, that's nice, it's great in theory, but we still stick with our randomized algorithm for primality testing. 
Uh, median finding, this is a, like a simple problem. It's like I give you an array and you have to find the of numbers, you have to find the median. Which you can do by sorting in n log n time, but uh, you can actually find the median in linear time, order n time. And this was discovered, uh, well, the fact that you can do it with randomness was discovered in the early 60s. And you can do it by basically a variant of quick sort, quick select. You know, if you're only looking for the median, you only have to recurse on one half of the, the list. And so it's, it's not hard to show you can do it in linear randomized time. And it's actually a big open problem to try to uh, do it deterministically in linear time. And they eventually figure it out. And it's a little bit complicated. So in practice, you would again use the randomized algorithm. But you know, they figured it out. Uh, that was actually Manuel Blum and others in the sort of early 70s. So the same asymptotic complexity, but still simpler to do it with randomness. Uh, here's another one. If I give you three n by n matrices, a, b, and c, and you have to decide yes or no, is a times b equal to c? This is another simple problem. It was another one of the first ones where people discovered a fast randomized algorithm for it. Uh, this person called Freivalds in the 70s showed that you can do this with a randomized algorithm in quadratic time. And actually, to this day, we don't know how to do it deterministically in quadratic time. In fact, the, the fastest way we know how to do it to this day, deterministically, is just multiply these two matrices together and check to see if you get this answer. So the running time for it is however long it takes to multiply matrices, which you may remember that there's these crazy algorithms for it that run in time like n to the 2.37 or something. So we don't know how to do this one in quadratic time deterministically. Uh, minimum spanning tree, there's a linear time algorithm, O of M time algorithm for finding the minimum spanning tree if you're allowed randomness. That was discovered in the mid-90s. And we don't know a deterministic algorithm that does it in linear time. We know one that runs in time order M times inverse Ackerman function of M times log of inverse Ackerman function of M, where inverse Ackerman function is some ridiculously slow growing uh, function, but cannot quite get it down to linear deterministically. Uh, three set. So, you know, of course, we only know exponential time algorithms for three set, but we've talked several times in this course about like what base of the exponent you can get. Fastest known randomized algorithm gets time 1.31 to the n. The fastest deterministic algorithm gets 1.34 to the n. So, a little bit of savings here. Uh, for the SD path problem, for these two problems, actually, we're going to talk more not about just time. Um, this is the ST path problem on undirected graphs. And again, in the 70s, they discovered a super easy algorithm to test if S is connected to T in log space, if you're allowed randomness. So you know you can do it in log squared space by Savage. They got down to log space. And the algorithm is super simple, and sometimes it's done in 251 even. You just take a random walk starting from S for n cubed steps. And if you hit T, you say they're connected. And if you don't, then it's true that with high probability, they're not connected. And we didn't know how to do that deterministically for a really long time, like 25 years. And then uh, famously, this guy Rheingold in 2004 showed a deterministic log space algorithm for this problem. It's quite complicated, though. Uh, bipartite perfect matching. I give you a bipartite graph. I want to know if there's a perfect matching in it. Here, the, the interesting result is that for this problem, it was known how to solve it with polynomial size circuits with really low depth, log squared n depth. So we know how to solve this in polynomial time, but this kind of showed that it could be done, in fact, like super efficiently in parallel because it has log squared depth circuits, which is kind of like parallel time of polynomial size, but they had to be randomized circuits. Again, randomized. And we didn't know how to do it deterministically. And actually, we still don't know how to do it deterministically, but just in 2016, there was like a breakthrough on this problem. They show deterministic circuits of log squared n depth for checking if a graph has a perfect matching of quasi-polynomial size, n to the log n size. So that's pretty good. But actually, this is a problem where we really don't know how to get it down to what we'd really like deterministically. And finally, this last problem I want to mention, polynomial identity testing. This is your given two arithmetic formulas. Let me not define it carefully, but you want to know if they compute the same formula if you expanded them out as polynomials. You can't just expand them out because you know, if you have a formula that you know, repeatedly squares things, then the number of terms could get super large, even though the, the size of the formula is polynomial. And uh, this algorithm, we know how to solve in polynomial time with a randomized algorithm. 
And it's like the best and like verging on the only example uh, we know where we just don't know how to solve it at all in polynomial time if you have to be deterministic. So this is like sort of a one example where like we really have no clue what to do if you don't give us uh, randomness. Well, even that's not true. We have some ideas about what to do, but um, so that's why I want to tell you on one hand a bunch of examples of some algorithms that are faster with randomness than without randomness. But uh, let me even put like a question mark here because you see actually in a lot of these cases, first people designed a randomized algorithm and then they worked really hard and they designed an about as good deterministic algorithm. That's a common phenomenon and um, it's actually believed, and I think we'll see more about this later uh, in the class, that this can always happen. That you don't fundamentally need randomness for efficient algorithms. But we cannot prove that yet. OK. Any questions? Yep? Yeah. So uh, a question which is open, and we'll get into, I guess, is is there any language that you can solve with a randomized polynomial time algorithm that you cannot solve with a deterministic polynomial time algorithm? And we actually believe, complexity theorists believe, the answer is no, despite some cases where we don't actually know how to do it. So actually, this is another case, like unlike you know, most of the ways it goes in complexity theory, where if we don't believe that you know, one computational model can simulate another computational model. Usually we just guess that they're different, that it's really impossible. Here's one case where we believe that, you know, deterministic polynomial time algorithms can do it, do whatever randomized polynomial time algorithms can do, even though we don't know how to prove it. Yep? Just one, yeah, so it is possible that a randomized algorithm may take off n to the square time, but the best deterministic algorithm can only take n to the sixth time for a Yeah, that's possible. So I don't think, you know, Complexity theorists would go so far. In fact, they probably would not believe that, like, if you can do it in quadratic time randomized, you can do it in quadratic time deterministic. But they do believe that if you can do it in polynomial time randomized, you can do it in polynomial time deterministic. Okay, so that's sort of all my motivation. So now the time has come to get into the details, and we're going to define, you know, randomized computation and associated randomized complexity classes. Okay, so we want to, let me start writing these words. You know, probabilistic or randomized Turing machine is, and then we'll reflect on what we should write. These are the same thing, probabilistic, randomized, they mean the same thing. So, yeah, how should we define a probabilistic Turing machine? So, you know, based on our experience, it's kind of like we just want to say, take your normal Turing machines and like give them access to a random number generator, basically. But let's think how to do this maybe a bit more uh, carefully or elegantly, especially in the context of Turing machines. I mean, we want to define things super carefully before we, you know, just move to pseudocode or whatever. Um, so one question you could ask is, well, what kind of, you know, random number generators do they get, like dice or like coins or whatever? And um, it turns out that like without loss of generality, you can just imagine they get the simplest kind of random number generation, which is like they can ask for a fair coin flip, okay, heads or tails, you know, or like if they want, you know, some random number, you can just give them zero or one with probability half each. Okay, and that turns out to be sufficient, you know, you know, uh, simulate any more complicated model where you gave them like dice or anything. I probably won't get into why that's the case, but you might have even seen it before. Okay, so. Fine, so you could just say, all right, so let's take our normal Turing machine definition and maybe give it like a coin flip instruction. You know, if you think about Turing machines as like codes with those like states and so forth, like maybe you could just have like a new kind of thing called like coin flip and it gives you back a zero or a one. Uh, you can do that, but I'm building up towards like a definition that'll be kind of a little bit elegant for our purposes. Um, so that'd be fine. Um, now, one thing you could do is make the following observation. For the most part, we're not going to care too much about randomness as a resource in the sense that we're not going to care too much, at least at the beginning, about like trying to save on random bits per se. So 
Um, instead, you could just imagine that like, the Turing machine gets a coin flip on every step. And if it doesn't want the coin flip, then fine. It doesn't have to use it. But then if it wants a coin flip this step, then it gets one. And so you know, that could like, waste coin flips if you want. But it, we're not going to worry about uh, that for now. So um, yeah, you could just imagine that it gets a coin flip at each step. And then how would you kind of formalize that? Well, basically, that lets it do one thing if the coin, like one kind of transition if the coin flip comes up heads, or another kind of transition if the coin flip comes up tails. So like at each step, it could have like two different kinds of transitions for like if its coin flip comes up head or if the coin flip comes up tails. And actually, this is exactly like something we've seen before. And um, it's exactly kind of like what goes on with a non-deterministic Turing machine, right? It has like two transition functions, delta 0 and delta 1. And in non-deterministic Turing machines, you just kind of imagine that like it sort of does both, like you know, hypothetically, or it like always picks the best one. And probabilistic Turing machine is going to be just the exact same thing, except you just imagine it randomly chooses which one to use at each step. So this is like a bit of a weird way to define it, but like it's going to prove to be a little bit elegant. You could just define it with coin flip instructions or whatever. But um, let's do it this way. A probabilistic Turing machine is you know, just like a normal T Turing machine, but with two transition functions. Which we'll call delta 0 and delta 1. You know, if you think about Turing machine code, it's like for every state and what symbol you're reading, um, you have like two different things that you might do. You could write this character, go this direction, and change to this state. Or you could write this character, uh, go this direction, and change to this state. And you imagine that which of the two you do is done based on a coin flip. And if, again, if you like want to like not use randomness, you can just have those two different things, transitions, be the same in this, this state. Um, and so actually, the definition of what a probabilistic Turing machine is is just the same as the, what it is for a non-deterministic machine. What changes is like how you think about its computation. So the way the computation goes is that in its computation, at each step, either delta 0 or delta 1 is used with probability half each. OK, independently for all the steps. So you can imagine that every step, the Turing machine flips a coin, or maybe that's how you'd implement it to decide which of its two options to do. Um, so that will be like a formal definition. You know, now we're kind of at the stage in life where we're going to quickly move if we're going to describe algorithms. We'll just describe them with like pseudocode, and you can have like you know some you know coin flip instruction, a random number generation instruction. But this would be how you would formally define it. Uh, okay, and so now for each given such a machine, for each input string x, you know m of x is going to go, and it's going to eventually accept or reject. More on that in a second. Um, so we don't change like you know this accepting and rejecting, but what we care about is the probability that it accepts or the probability that it rejects. Okay, so we're going to care about the probability that m of x accepts. Okay. Any questions about this? So on one hand, like. It's, everything is going to be kind of consistent with like the mental model that you probably have, having been experienced, uh, you know, randomized computation before. And at first I thought like, you know, this would all go very fast, but like there's a lot of little details that like it's worth mentioning when we talk about these things. So let's take it slow and mention all these things. So here's some comments I'd like to make. Um, you know, once you introduce randomness, uh, you know, um, you know, like weird things like, you know, uh, loops that, you know, decide to halt at each step with some probability and so forth. Um, so we want to, let me just emphasize that, 
you know, as in all our models, we'll assume, or we'll only worry about Turing machines M, randomized Turing machines M, with the property that, you know, M of X, like, always halts, you know, in finite time for all X. Okay, so this is like, you know, insisting on like only sticking with deciders, okay? We don't want like a, you know, Turing machine that can ever get into, let's say, an infinite loop. And uh, I, maybe I won't emphasize this point too much, but we even kind of prefer to have a machine that like, you have a running time bound such that it never goes past that running time, no matter how the coin flips come out. Okay, actually, I'm gonna, I'll write this later when we talk about running time, but this is something you should bear in mind. And, um, uh, okay, let me say that next remark a little later. Okay, so, you know, think of M like a randomized algorithm, and now for each input we care about the probability that it accepts, okay? So now let's get back to the point that, like, you know, if you have a randomized algorithm, like, it's trying to solve, like, a computational problem or decide a language, there's going to be some error probability, right? Otherwise, we may have just been talking about deterministic algorithms. So let me make uh, the definition that explains what it means to accept the language with some amount of error. Okay, so here's going to be our first definition. We'll say such a randomized Turing machine decides a language uh, L, doesn't stand for log space here, it's just a language now, L with, okay, here's what I'm defining, one-sided error epsilon. Okay, uh, if, okay, I'll, I'll expand on what I mean by this one-sided error here, uh, but here's the two conditions. For all strings that are in the language, we want that M accepts that string with probability at least one minus epsilon, and for all strings that are not in the language, L accepts that string, sorry, M accepts that string with probability zero. Okay, so this is our definition of accepting with one-sided error. And why is it called one-sided? We're going to get into more details on this later, but it's called one-sided because these are not symmetric conditions, okay? So it's like only on one you know, side of this box do you have error. So if it's in the language, it will probably, the machine will probably accept it, but it might reject it. On the other hand, we ask that if it's not in the language, it always rejects it 100% of the time. Okay, so uh, if you're familiar with terms, I'm gonna get this backwards, like from statistics or whatever, like there's the issue of like false positives and false negatives. And this one I had to think for like 10 minutes to decide whether I thought it was false positive or false negative. So I think this is like, there's no false positives. So, like, the machine never says accept, even though it's actually not in the language. But sometimes it might say reject, even though it is in the language. Okay, it, don't try to keep it in your head wh which way it goes, but, uh, I mean, just maybe remember what's in this box, okay? So, if it's in the language, it has a good chance of accepting, and if it's uh, not in the language, it always rejects. Okay, so, in other words, if the machine accepts, you have like a, you know exactly what's going on. If the machine accepts, then you're like, it's definitely in the language. Hopefully I got that right. If it rejects, then you're like, well, it's probably not in the language, but I'm not totally sure. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so now I want to make a like, really important uh, point, which we always make when talking about randomized computation. And that is the point that this is still a worst case notion, okay, in the sense that it's still a condition that has to hold about every string, every input. Right? It's like a for all x something happens, okay? So you have, no matter what the input is, you have this guarantee. The only randomness comes from the algorithm itself. The randomness is just from the algorithm. And that's in contrast to um, 
the possibility of considering random inputs, okay? We're not considering what happens for a random input, or like if you choose a random input with high probability, the machine does this or that. We're actually n basically never gonna talk about that in this class, okay? So it's always gonna be uh, guarantees that hold for every x, and the only you know, possibility of error comes from like the coin flips of the algorithm. Okay. So it is also interesting to talk about you know, what happens for like, uh, if you have a random inputs, but um, we might talk about that a little bit at some point, but not for the next while. Okay, let me write this box over here again, because I'm gonna consider what happens if you vary it a little. So this is our condition. that we're studying right now. So this is what it means to accept with one-sided error epsilon. Okay, epsilon is a parameter, maybe between zero and one. So first thing I wanna say is, what if we imagine this definition with epsilon being zero? Okay, so that would just mean this which I guess would in turn mean this, okay? So that would be like requiring that the machine outputs accept 100% of the time uh, when it's in the language and it rejects 100% of the time when it's not in the language. So all I wanna say about this case is like, in this case, if you have like a randomized machine with these properties, then uh, that's fine, but like you could have had a deterministic machine with the same properties. I mean, you could have just said, well, take my randomized machine that like, has these two different transition functions and just uh, turn it into a deterministic machine that always uses one of them, like always uses delta one. Then we know that machine will have the normal acceptance criteria that like for all x that are in the language, it'll accept, and for all x that are not in the language, it'll reject. Because you know, this condition is saying like, no matter how the random bits turn out, you get the right answer. So, always choosing the delta one transition function is just like imagining that like all the coin flips that are ever made came up heads. But, you know, if you have this super strong condition, then that means that even when they all come up heads, you get the right answer. So, um, you know, if you tried this, you would just get back to deterministic computation. And on the other hand, this kind of shows that like deterministic computation is like a subcase of randomized computation. Does that make sense? Okay, let's now take it in the other possible direction. What if we made like epsilon like one? Well, that wouldn't quite make sense, but like basically one. So what if we only require this? If it's not in the language, you always reject. Um, and if it's in the language, you just have to accept with positive probability. Now, this, you can make this definition if you want. It would not be a practically useful definition for the following reason, you know, this this positive probability could be like exponentially small. You know, it could only accept in when strings in the language if like the coin flip came out to be like all heads or something, which is exponentially small probability. So if you had like a theoretical machine with this prob problem, property, it wouldn't actually be useful to you in practice because you know, it's basically almost never getting the right answer in this case. But you could still think about it. And actually we have thought about this a lot in this course. So I claim that this is exactly what's going on in some notion of computation we've talked about a lot. Does anybody recognize it? Yeah? Uh, not yeah, this is exactly what we require for like acceptance, accepting or like overall accepting of a non-deterministic Turing machine. So we didn't phrase it like this in terms of probability, but we could have. This is actually the exact same thing, so let me talk you through it for a second. So our non-deterministic Turing machines also have this property that they have two different transition functions, and we kind of like imagine that like all of them, all possibilities like happen like simultaneously, or like in, in hypothetical branching. But then how do we define overall acceptance of a non-deterministic Turing machine? We said like, oh, we're gonna consider it to have accepted if at least one branch accepted. And we're going to consider it to have rejected if all branches rejected. And that's exactly this, right? It's like, if you think about, you know, the non-deterministic choices being made probabilistically, then, you know, 
at least one branch accepts if and only if the probability of acceptance is non-zero. Right? If all branches accept, you know, that means however the coin flips come out, it would be zero. And if at least one branch accepts, it means there's some positive probability of the thing accepting. So, you know, we didn't define it this way originally, but you can think about non-determinism as like probabilistic Turing machines with this like bizarro notion of acceptance. In order to like accept a string overall, they just have to accept with some positive probability. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Hmm. And in some sense, that's going to be an explanation for why, like, um, well, like non-determinism is like strictly more powerful than like randomness in a way. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. In some weird way, it is has this property. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's kind of get back to like real life though. Non-determinism is not a realistic model of computation. It's just something we think about theoretically. But now, randomized algorithms we do think about in real life. Um, and you know, we're happy when you know, epsilon is some reasonable number, like 0.1. OK, so let's now do our favorite thing and define a complexity class, which is called R time f of n. R stands for randomized. And it's all the languages L such that there's a probabilistic machine, M, uh, with running time order f of n. And I'm actually going to come back to what this means, but let me just write it, um, which accepts L with one-sided error One third. Okay, and I'm going to come back to like this justification too. Looks like that's a little bit weird. Um, okay, so two points about this definition. One is a more minor point, but what do I mean by the running time of a probabilistic machine? Normally, you know, the running time is this worst case thing where you max over all inputs x of length n of, you know, the number of steps m of x takes. That's our normal notion of the running time of a Turing machine m as a function of n. But now our Turing machines m have the property that they can take differing amounts of times depending on how the coin flips turn out. Actually, this came up in non-deterministic computation too. We're going to have the same you know, definition we had there. In the spirit of like, you know, sticking with worst case analysis, we're also just going to max over the coin flips. Okay, so max over the coin flips or the randomness. So we're going to say, you know, we'll take the worst number of steps for length n input for like the worst coin outcome. Okay, and then that's kind of uh, nice in the sense that, you know, if we say a probabilistic Turing machine is running time order n squared, that means for all length, for all length n inputs, no matter how the coin flips turned out, like I guarantee you it's going to run in time at most order n squared. Okay, so that's kind of uh, reassuring to take this worst case notion of uh, running time. Now, you could actually say, well, how about if I put um, the expected number of steps it takes rather than the max number of steps it takes? Uh, it turns out, and this will be a little bit on your homework, that uh, it doesn't really make a difference, actually. Um, and because it doesn't really make a difference, we're just going to go with max because it's like simpler, right? Then you can say this Turing machine like never takes more than like 10 n squared steps, no matter how the coins turn out. Okay, so that's one comment. Any questions about that? Yeah. Have like a very very small exponential small probability that you have the x. Great question. Uh, yeah, the question was whether you could have like an algorithm where the expected number of uh, steps was polynomial, but the with maybe some exponentially small probability it takes an exponentially long time. You can design algorithms like that, and um, 
The reason that that's fine is, uh, if you have an algorithm like that, you can always do the following generic thing, which is, let's say its expected number of steps is 10 times n, but like maybe occasionally it goes crazy, like exponential. You can just uh, change the machine to another machine where you like cap the running time at like 100 times n, or 100 times n squared. So you just like ins you put like an alarm clock into the machine, and if it's gone longer than 100 n squared time, then you just like stop it and like I don't know output an arbitrary answer. And that'll have two effects. One, it'll have a good effect on the running time in the sense that you'll this new machine will like have an absolute cap on the number of steps it ever takes. It'll have a bad effect on the error because like now you've, you know, by introducing this cap, occasionally you hit this running time cap and then like the answer you give, you know, it could be garbage. But you can use Markov's inequality, it's not hard, to show that like that'll only increase the error by a little bit. So it'll increase the, or decrease the, you know, correctness here by a little bit, but as we're about to see in a few seconds, that's also not a big deal. Yeah, so the reason it doesn't matter is there's like a generic transformation that takes a, an algorithm running in expected so much time to one that has basically the same properties but basically has a max of that on its running time. Great. Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, now what about this? Actually, there's even two arbitrary aspects to this. The, the main weird looking one is that like I fixed this epsilon to be one third, which looks quite arbitrary. And you can also ask about one-sided error. We're going to actually later talk about different variants where like maybe you can err on this case too, but let me just stick for one-sided error for now. But the one-third looks kind of weird. Like why did I choose one-third? You might ask like would I get different languages, like a different class of languages if I put a quarter or 0.9 or 0.1 here or what? And the answer is if I put any constant number here between 0 and 1, it actually defines the same complexity class. So, you know, it's traditional to pick one-third, but um, it wouldn't have really mattered. So let me write that. Uh, so this is a, a lemma which I'm pretty sure you've seen before, let's say in 251, so I'm not going to write the proof, because I think it'll be pretty clear. And it's just the property that, like, you know, if you have an algorithm that makes some error, you can decrease the probability of error by like running it a bunch of times and like say taking the majority answer or something. So this lemma goes by the name either success amplification or error reduction. It's the same thing. I personally always like mess it up. I always call this error amplification, which is exactly the wrong thing. But like I somehow my mind sticks to it because like error is you know what you're worried about and like you do have the feeling of like amplifying something. So if I call it error amplification, like that's an accident and this is what I mean. So uh, here's the lemma. Suppose you know M is a machine that accepts, uh, let's say decides language L with one-sided error epsilon. And then let k be any number, like 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. And then um, define the following alternate Turing machine. You know, a probabilistic Turing machine. I'll write m superscript k as follows. I'll just write the pseudocode. Uh, on input x, um, you know, just uh, run m of x, k times, in a row. Uh, in fact, you don't always have to finish because if it ever accepts, sorry, if it ever rejects, then like overall reject. Okay, so if you're running along and it outputs reject, wait a minute, uh, is that right? I, don't know, I think I want to write accept. Well, let's write one and we'll see what is correct. Um, and if all the runs, let's 
try reject. Then at the end, reject. Okay, which one is correct depends on this definition. So let's maybe we should take a poll. Did I get it right here? Let's see. I'm getting some thumbs up. Okay, let, let's go over it. So let's see. So this kind of algorithm has the property that if it comes back with accept, then it's definitely not in the wait, right, it's definitely in the language. If it comes back with accept, it's definitely in the language, because if it were out of the language, it would always reject. No false positive. If it comes back with a reset, reject, you're not exactly sure. So if you ever see it, as soon as you see an accept, you're like, great, got it. I can accept. And if you see like reject like k times in a row, then you're still not sure, but you're like, I'm pretty sure it's a reje I should reject. Okay, so I'm not done writing the lemma, but um, uh, what do I want to say now? Yeah, so then this new Turing machine, MK, uh, also decides L, but with better error probability, with one-sided error, one minus epsilon to the k. Okay, so we'll not prove it, but like basically on each run, the probability, if it's, if it's in the language, at each run the probability you'll get uh, reject is epsilon. So the probability you'll get like k rejects in a row is like epsilon to the k, and that's the only way things can go wrong. And of course, let me just say, of course, the time of mk, this new machine we've got, is basically k times the time of m. Okay, so this is what I was saying before. You kind of like trade time for error probability. And in particular, it means that you know, if uh, in this definition, which I cannot get up simultaneously, oops. In this definition, this one third is kind of arbitrary. If I had made it um, half, which is worse, you kind of like a sloppier notion, well then whenever I had such an algorithm, I could repeat it like a couple times, like even one time, twice would be enough, and it would get epsilon down to a quarter. If I took my machine and repeated it three times, epsilon would go down to one eighth. And so in fact, this could have even been something quite bad, like 0.9, like only in this case, you have a 10% chance of accepting. It's fine. If I repeat it like 100 times, I'll boost the error up to something that's like ridiculous, boost the error down to something that's like ridiculously small. Okay, and so for any constant epsilon, I can kind of get any other constant epsilon out, even a really small one at the expense of taking k to be a big constant. So all of this only affects the running time by a constant. Okay, and since in this definition we already have a constant big O built into the definition, it means that nothing changes. Is that okay? So in fact, if you're, you know, you have uh, this machine that has error epsilon being one-third, you can also, k doesn't have to even be a constant. You can like uh, repeat m n times. And then the running time will go up by a factor of n, which is a little bit bad, but the, the good side is that your, you know, your success probability will be like one minus a third to the n, which is, you know, for all intents and purposes, one. Okay. Good. That I means it doesn't really matter what number you put there, so we'll just put one third. And now we'll also make a, an extended definition that we always make. RP, randomized polynomial time, is just the union of this over all polynomial bounds. Thing on the point before, uh, supposed to say epsilon to the k instead of one minus epsilon to the k. I think it's epsilon to the k. No, wrong. It says one minus epsilon to the k. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. You're right. The error is like the amplification versus reduction. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. It's epsilon to the k. Thanks. Success probability one minus epsilon to the k. I always mix that up. Okay, RP, great. Um, 
Okay. So uh, let's make some very simple facts. As we just defined a new complexity class, randomized polynomial time. Yeah. Our time f of n, you have to show the ones that are probably exactly one third or anything less than one third. Uh, just um, you know, you just have to show that for each string, like the success, each string that's in the language, you accept with probability at least two thirds. Yeah. Okay, so we have a new complexity class here. So let's like take a second to like fit it into all these complexity classes we now know. Okay, one thing that is true is that P is a subset of RP. Anything you can solve in deterministic polynomial time, you can also solve in randomized polynomial time. You can just ignore your ability to make coin flips and do the old algorithm. Okay, and you'll have error probability zero, in fact. Or at most, yeah. In terms of an upper bound, I claim that this is actually contained in NP. And why is that? Well, it's, uh, it's basically because of this reason. Let's say you have a randomized polynomial time algorithm, a coin flipping algorithm that has these two properties with epsilon being one third. So this is two thirds and this is zero. Well, as I said before, you know, syntactically a randomized Turing machine and a non-deterministic Turing machine are exactly the same thing. It's just a question of how we interpret acceptance. And so if you have this machine that at each step has one of two choices and you know, if the string is not in the language, it, it, it always rejects. And if the string is in the language, it has, over all these choices, it has a two-thirds chance of accepting. It's basically like saying like two-thirds of the non-deterministic branches, if you view it that way, lead to a rejecting, an accepting state. And to be an NP, you just need to have the same situation where like at least one of them is accepting. So if you have the boxed property over there, with epsilon being two-thirds, then in particular, you have this bubbled property here. Yeah, so randomized, I'm going to give an example of an RP algorithm in a second, but like it's one that um, it, uh, it kind of succeeds when it gets like a good uh, random string or random su succession of random choices. Um, and if you have that property, then like the problem is also in NP because like uh, NP succeeds if there's at least one set of random choices that works out for you. So let me give an example of these two things that will um, motivate things and also make things a bit clearer, I hope. <laughs> and it's one that we've talked about uh, before in this class and also about before in this course. And it's kind of primality testing, but it's opposite. It's compositeness testing. Okay. So recall that, um, okay, composites, that's the language of all strings representing numbers in binary uh, notation that are composite. Composite? Anyway, not prime. Uh, and we know that this is in NP. Okay, secretly we actually know it's in P because of this famous primality testing algorithm, but let's ignore that for a second. It's easy to see that it's in NP. It's a good example of it, right? Because for example, the verifier uh, will just expect to get a factor of the number. And it'll check that the factor, the proposed factor, divides that number. Okay, or if you want to think of it non-deterministically, like the non-deterministic algorithm just um, by using branching, like guesses a factor and then checks its guess. So that was uh, easy to see. A theorem which is from 74 actually proved by Sullivan and Strassen first, is that composites is actually in RP. Okay. So uh, it's better to show this in RP because RP is a subclass of NP. Okay, so that means there's a randomized algorithm. You give it a, let's think about it here. It's a randomized algorithm. You give it a, a number as input. If the number really is composite, then the machine will accept with high probability. And if the number is really prime, the machine will never accept. Okay, so it'll never like wrongly tell you that the number is uh, 
I always fix this up. <laughs> if it's, let's see, let me just try to restate it. If the number is composite, uh, the machine has a good chance of accepting. And if it's prime, yeah, it'll never accept. Okay? So it'll never false you. So now, like, positive is associated with composite. So it'll never falsely tell you that the number is composite. But if it tells you the number is prime, you're like, okay, it's probably true, but you're not 100% sure. Okay, so, you know, if I had um, another hour and 20 minutes, I could give you the entire proof of this. Maybe you've even seen it before. Sometimes they do it in other courses. We're not going to give all the details of the proof because a lot of them are just details about number theory. It's not a number theory course. So I'm just going to tell you some facts which are not very hard to prove. So I guess it's the proof sketch. But I want to go through it because it illustrates the, uh, the idea. Okay, so here's uh, some uh, setup. Let x be a number. And uh, let's, let's assume it's odd. I don't know if we need that, but let's assume it's odd because even numbers are always composite, except for two. Uh, okay, write uh, x. Take out all the factors of 2 in x. So let write x as 2 to the s times d, where d is odd. These are also not important. Like You don't have to memorize this or anything, but I'm telling it to you for culture. So uh, b is called, this is a number. Uh, compositeness witness, which I'll just short into witness later, for x, if some weird number theory things are true. So if all of these facts are true, b to the d is not congruent to 1 mod x, and um, b to the d b to the 2d, b to the 4d, b to the 8d, all the way up to b to the 2 to the s minus 1d. These are also not congruent to uh, negative 1 mod x. Okay, so why all this incomprehensible number theory stuff is relevant, just take my word for it. Uh, Okay, so this is the definition of whether a number b is a compositeness witness for a number x, if all these conditions hold. Okay, whatever. Okay, so uh, here, I mean, there's a reason for making this weird definition and giving it this weird name. This is like some number theory fact, which, you know, can be proved in about one hour, depending on a person's background. If x is a prime number, then uh, no b at all is a witness, composite witness, for x. That's reassuring based on the fact that the term is called compositeness witness. Okay? It'd be weird otherwise. And the other fact is, if x is composite, then uh, at least three quarters of all b's in the range uh, between uh, 0 and x are compositeness witnesses for x. Okay, it's just uh, that's, a, that's a fact that one can prove in one hour using a little number theory. And it has this, like, this, I mean, very reassuring flavor of, of feeling, right? So if x is prime, there's, there's no witnesses. And if x is composite, actually a lot of the numbers between 0 and x are witnesses for its compositeness. Okay? So that's a number theory fact. Here's a computer science fact, which you should know uh, in light of 251. Um, you can check whether... A given number b, you know, in the range we care about, is a witness for x in time polynomial in the length of x, the number of bits in it. Okay, and that's because the, the key thing to uh, you know, know is that 
you can raise one n-digit number to another n-digit number mod another third n-digit number in poly n time by this like repeated squaring and modulo taking thing. Okay, so if you forget that, try to remember, but for this, uh, the purposes of this class, just we'll re use these two facts. Okay, and that's great. So I mean, it says if we have like a candidate B, we can, we can efficiently test if it is, uh, has all these properties and therefore is a compositeness witness. Okay, and once all these facts are put in place, you have a super simple algorithm for attempting to check compositeness. Done by CMU's Gary Miller and uh, Harvard's Michael Rabin back in the 70s or something. 70 something, five. This is basically in his PhD thesis. Uh, so the algorithm is simple. Pick a random uh, number B between 0 and N. Sorry. First of all, this should say x, x, okay, uh, and uh, you have to think maybe how to do that if you only have coin flips, but let me just work at the level of pseudocode here. Uh, and then just check if it's a witness. Okay, that's the whole algorithm. Actually, sometimes you might see uh, the algorithm say, you know, repeat this a few times. Um, but, you know, for our purposes, we can just pick exactly one candidate B and just check if that one B is a witness for X. And what do these two, so this is a polynomial time algorithm because of the CS fact, a randomized polynomial time algorithm. And what do the two number theory facts tell us? They exactly tell us the following, that if X is in the language of composites, then the probability that the algorithm accepts, well, that's exactly the probability that B happens to be a witness, which number theory assures us is at least three quarters. Which, by the way, this is another number theory fact that's bigger than three, two thirds. That was a joke. <laughs> uh, and if X is not composite, then there are no witnesses, so the probability that the algorithm accepts is zero. Okay, so indeed this algorithm, which is a randomized polynomial time algorithm, has uh, these properties with epsilon being even in one quarter, but in particular two thirds. Okay, which thereby justifies this theorem. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Great. <clears throat> All right. Now, finally, I want to address this underlined term up there, one-sided error. Okay. You might say, like, you know, the problem is most famously known as primality testing. Why did you switch to composite testing? Well, it's because composites, well, it's related to the fact that, like, you know, composites is in NP for like kind of obvious reasons, but it's like far from obvious that primality is an NP. It's sort of easy to have, you know, a certificate for a number being composite. It's not so obvious how to get a certificate for being prime. Now actually we talked about this before and there's a Piazza post. There is like a nice certificate for primality uh, figured out by Pratt, but it's not very easy. It's a little bit complicated. Um, and so that leads us to the question of whether like primes is in RP. Well, it comes to where this um, one-sidedness of the definition comes in. Like, we decided that we're going to have, you know, no false positives, but we could have false negatives. You know, so there, the question is, this is an example of an algorithm where if you get a witness for compositeness, you're like, I'm 100% sure this is composite. If you don't find a witness for compositeness, you're like, well, it could still be um, composite, but it's probably prime. But can we have an algorithm with the reverse property? where like you kind of pick some random stuff to try to convince yourself that a number is prime and you want that like if you hit upon the right certificate of a sort then you're totally sure it's prime and you know there's a high chance that you'll hit upon such a certificate. Uh, 
That's not so clear. I mean, this was also not so clear because you need to know like some number theory, but like it was figured out early on in the 70s. What we do know is that primes is in co-RP. Okay, well, what is co-RP? It's just, as always, it's all the languages whose complement is in RP. Okay, and the complement of primes is compositeness. So this is immediate from the fact that compositeness is in RP. And co-RP is just like, you know, you can just say it's the, the strings, sorry, the languages whose comp complements are in RP, but it's also just like uh, reversing this notion where you allow false negatives instead of allowing false positives. Uh, and let me even write that. What this is saying is that, you know, co-RP is basically, you know, you have a polynomial time M, randomized M, you know, L is in co-RP. If, um, with these properties, uh, when x is in the language, the probability that m of x accepts is 1. And when x is not in the language, the probability that m of x accepts is less than 1 third. Let's see, did I get this right? I think I got it right. You just got to negate that definition correctly. Right, so uh, actually, it turns out that this is true. It is in RP. Took a lot longer to prove, though. Oh, let me just mention while I have it here, P is also a, set of co a subset of co-RP, which is a subset of co-NP. just by the definition of complementing a language. Okay, so it turns out the primes is in RP. There are uh, efficiently findable with randomness witnesses for being a prime. And not only, NP tells us that there are like short witnesses for being a prime, but maybe you need a crazy prover or some like magic certificate to, be to find such a witness. But this actually shows that there's an efficient algorithm using randomness that can find some kind of certificate for primality. And uh, it was a lot harder to find. It was not proven until 1987 by Edelman and Huang. And it's very hard. I mean, their proof is very hard. It uses arithmetic, algebraic, geometry, and analytic number theory. And like there's elliptic curves and I don't know. But it's very complicated. But you know, at a high level, what it means is there's witnesses or certificates for primality that are not only easily checkable, easily means polynomial time. That's to say that primality is in NP. And easily findable with randomness. Okay, so that was pretty cool. People were like very happy in 1987 with this. Um, because it means if you have a number and you're wondering about whether it's prime or composite, like you don't now kind of care either way. You can kind of look for witnesses that it's composite. And we know that if it is composite, I mean, when I say look for witnesses, use this kind of Miller-Rabin method. Look for witnesses that it's composite. And uh, if it really is composite, you'll find one pretty easily. And, like in parallel, you can try looking for witnesses that it's prime, if you can study this algorithm. And if it really is prime, you'll find that out rather efficiently. Uh, and that's cool, because it sort of means that no matter which it is, prime or composite, like in a relatively short amount of time, if you like keep trying, you'll find the answer one way or another. And you'll sort of never there's a sense in which you'll never be unsure. You'll never make a wrong answer. You might just get to an inconclusive stage, but you'll never get to a wrong answer. And that's a notion of error that we have just enough time to get into called um, zero-sided error, zero error. Okay, so as of you know, 1987, they knew that primality was in 
RP, that was the harder one, and CoRP. So it was in the intersection of RP and CoRP. And uh, even before that, this class, this is the class of languages, was already studied because it's a very interesting one. It's very much like the probability analog of NP intersect CoNP, which is something that we talked about before. Like this is a case where like, no matter what the string was, there was a short certificate that it was in the language, or there's a short certificate that it was outside the language. So you could always become convinced one way or the other. This has the same flavor, but like not only do these witnesses for being in or out exist, you can find them yourself efficiently with polynomial, with randomness. So this particular class has a special name. This is called ZPP. The Z stands for zero-sided error. And I'll expand upon that a little. And we're going to take this as just as our definition of ZPP. It's RP intersect CoRP. But as we'll see a little bit in this class and also a little bit on the homework, there are several equivalent definitions for ZPP. And that's very nice. It tells you that it's a very reasonable and interesting class that you can think about in several different ways. Um, this notion of uh, probabilistic algorithms with zero error. So before I said like that's the same as a deterministic algorithm, but uh, there is like a slightly broader notion of randomized algorithms that allows for zero error. And I'll just illustrate it here uh, with primality in mind, and maybe you'll get the exact details on the homework. So uh, to repeat, right, like now once we know these facts about uh, primality, we have um, this Miller-Rabin algorithm one. I kind of said this in words, but let me repeat it. That finds compositeness witnesses. Okay, and this is like no false positives. Well, I guess in the context of primality, it's no false negatives, but whatever. <laughs> and then Edelman Huang, algorithm two, it finds primality witnesses if the number really is prime. Okay, so it has no false positives for primality. And what you can now do when you have both these algorithms is like make a combo algorithm, which will be polynomial time, and it'll just have three steps. Run algorithm one, given a number x, you want to care if it's prime or not. Run algorithm one. If it says composite, then you're like, great, I know for sure it's composite. Okay, but it might not. So then if it doesn't, you run algorithm two. Okay, and if it says prime, then you're like, great, I know for sure that it's prime. And okay, it might sadly happen that you didn't get a witness either way after your first two runs. So in this case, let me just say our algorithm is going to output don't know, or question mark. So this is actually sort of like a twist on, on the accept reject model where we kind of have yes, no, or question mark. But let me study what you can say about this a combo algorithm. First of all, it's polynomial time. Well, it's randomized and it's polynomial time. Um, but it has a very nice error guarantee, which is that in some sense it never outputs a wrong answer. Okay, you know, the, the downside is sometimes it outputs no answer, or it outputs question mark, no comment. But if it tells you an actual answer, that answer is definitely right. So I'm continuing the combo algorithm's properties. And uh, it's polynomial time, and it never outputs a wrong answer. Now, so far, like, if I just told you that was its other property, it wouldn't be so great, because you get an algorithm that just always outputs question mark. That would suck. But the final main uh, property of it is that, you know, the probability that it's inconclusive 
So for all x, regardless of whether they're prime or not, the probability that the algorithm on x outputs question mark is small. It's at most, uh, well, one third, let's say. OK, so this is the sense in which it has zero error, but it's still um, in polynomial time, and it's still doing something good. And you can make this one third, like again, as small as you like. You can make it one ninth by repeating the algorithm twice. And if you ever get a witness on these first two steps, you're in great shape. If you get two question marks back, you output question mark. But here, the probability you'll get two question marks back, you're doing independent runs of the algorithm, will be one ninth. OK, so you can do it 10 times and make it 1 over 1024 and, and so forth. So uh, algorithms with this kind of behavior are exactly the same as, sorry, languages decidable by algorithms with this sort of behavior are exactly the same as languages that are in RP, intersect Cohen RP, which is, um, I think, kind of clear from what I've said here, but just to make total sure, uh, it's going to be on the homework. OK, we didn't even talk about two-sided error yet, but that'll come up uh, next class. I should also mention that I have one more trip in this semester, which is coming up next week. So next uh, week, you'll be treated to the stylings of professors this time, instead of grad students. Uh, on Tuesday, you'll have uh, Professor Guruswamy talking about BPP. And Professor uh, Ada will lecture on Thursday about TBD. OK, so see you uh, in a week. Yeah. Class TBD. <laughs> uh, it means to be determined. Uh, <laughs> Actually, it'll probably be not about randomness. It'll probably be about alternation and the polynomial time hierarchy. But we'll see. <laughs>